Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this session looking at what the crisis has revealed about our health systems and the future directions for reform. Now, during the session, let me do a little bit of housekeeping first. During, during the session, I really do encourage you to use the chat function um, in order to, to ask uh, questions for everybody who is attending uh, who, or your panelists in, in this session, or use the Twitter feed. And I'll remind you the Twitter feed is hashtag GovAfterShock. Now, this event, as I hope you all know by now, is one of a large series of events that are going on at the moment, looking at government after shock. And this is a bit of an experiment by the OECD. Uh, now it's got a load of events took place yesterday. I think about 60 events uh, in different countries in the world, asking the same sorts of questions to get the, the answers from localities across the world to see if you know, we can pull together mutual learnings here. So this session today, of all the sessions today, which are being done in a more international way, uh, will also be used and compared with those national studies in order to see if we can, can draw some more general lessons. And, and of course, the, the idea, there's three underlying questions that we're getting at uh, across all the different uh, policy areas that we're looking at. We want to know what we should leave behind after this crisis, what we should keep that we were doing well before the crisis and what we should be doing differently uh, now that we know much more about the, the vulnerabilities of our system to shocks. So this session today is looking about what the crisis has revealed about our health systems. Um, and the idea eventually will be to contribute to a, the development of a, a call to action for governments and indeed all of us that will be developed by the OECD in consultation with all our usual stakeholders. So enough of an introduction, I think. Let me introduce our fantastic panelists and let get, let's get down to the, the discussion. I am delighted to be able to welcome uh, Ilza Vinkeli from uh, Latvia, who is the Minister of Health, has been for some time. Thank you very much, Ilza. Uh, we have Frank Fayen, who's the Minister of States for Public Health, Wellbeing, and the National Drug Strategy in Ireland. We have Ran Balisa, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at Hlalit Health Services and the founding director of Hlalit Research Institute, which is one of the big uh, healthcare providers in Israel. We have Sun Min Kin, who is president of the, the Health Insurance Review and Assessment Service uh, Hira, who's joining us from Korea, uh, an old friend of the OECD, as is our final panelist, Olivia Wigsell, the Director General at the National Board of Health and Welfare, who is joining us from Sweden. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for, for giving up your time to attend this meeting today. So let me go straight into the, the first question. What we'll do is have a couple of rounds of questions from me, the moderator, and then we'll look at, see what questions we've got from the, the people listening in. So the, the first question, um, you know, the crisis clearly has been a bit of a challenge for, for health systems uh, and has resulted in incredibly rapid changes in some areas, uh, much more rapid than I think we ever thought possible before the crisis hits, particularly in the use, I suppose, of, of technology, in terms of requalifying staff at record time, redeploying them, and in using behavioral change uh, to try and deal with the, with the pandemic, particularly in communicating with citizens. But of course, we, we, we have been struggling to keep a balance between responding to the, uh, the crisis and trying to adjust the operations of government to match the complexity and scale of the challenge. So the first real question is how ready was the public health system in your country to absorb and manage this level of change? And, and Ilza, perhaps I could start with you from, from Latvia, please. Yeah, thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm honored to be a panelist today. Uh, as you may know, Latvia has uh, one of the worst hounded uh, uh, health system in the UA. And uh, what we are did and what we are doing now, 
uh, actually I could describe as a miracle. Uh, because uh, the situation when we struggle for decades with, uh, with uh, insufficient uh, uh, financial uh, coverage, uh, we actually, uh, actually we, we, we are doing miracle. And uh, we uh, somehow the shock and stress led us to regroup and reorganize and uh, use mm -hmm. our uh, best resources. Uh, that is uh, uh, our uh, uh, our uh, uh, health workers. We have a very strong, uh, uh, like a little bit old school epidemiological uh, services, and uh, uh, test and trace and. Um, uh, also very good cooperation with uh, private uh, uh, services provider because the mostly Latvian health system uh, is based on uh, public providers, but specifically co uh, cooperation uh, in testing capacities, uh, like increasing dramatically in very short uh, period of time, uh, I could describe that as, uh, as our uh, success story. Thank you for that. I mean, I think it's one of the things that came out from the yesterday's discussions in, in all these country specific uh, events that have been taking place. One of the quotes from one of those sessions that struck me very much is that people are more innovative than institutions. And it, it sounds as if that's been, been the case in, in Latvia. Uh, perhaps I could move to you, Minister Feyen. Um, how, how was Ireland been doing? Do you think your system was ready to uh, absorb and manage this level of, of change? Absolutely not. We had uh, a, a shortage of, of critical care beds. Um, we were uh, moving in with a new slaunch of care, which was uh, working on extension program reform of the health services. And it's based on uh, uh, in the right care, in the right place, at the right time, by the right team. Uh, so we had a huge issue that we had to build up the surge of capacity to ensure the maximum possible number of critical care and acute beds were available. And um, we also had a significant work to develop an acute and critical care capacity plan. Um, but the, look, we were very, very fortunate that there was a willingness of all staff and in particular nursing staff to undertake the training and support and intensive surge capacity preparations. And um, uh, unfortunately we had to defer most routine elective scheduled care activity. But we, you know, when it came to volunteers and e-technology, um, we, we've done quite well and we've learned a lot of lessons um, in the last few, uh, few, few months. Perhaps you might want to just give, give us some more examples of what those, those lessons were. Yeah, um, yeah well, uh, we, we, we had, um, you know, on primary care, um, we, 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 we had to get to, uh, availability of su sufficient staffing was a huge key challenge um, facing primary and community care sector. And um, also we, 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 we had difficulty recruiting for staff for dedicated testing and uh, that's underway now, but it was an issue from the very, very beginning. Uh, but also um, uh, I suppose we've had to scale back uh, many primary uh, or community services uh, to enable resources to be deployed as part of responses. So, a lot of uh, people have, have to be deployed from other areas to work on the COVID-19 uh, um, uh, pandemic. And that has caused, um, I suppose, a backlog in, in other areas. But I suppose this is the same for, 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 for most countries. Yeah, I think absolutely it is. And I, and I think we, we might come to back to talk about just how you've been trying to manage, manage that problem of the double the, the double demand of both COVID and under the care maybe in, in a few moments, but, but thank you very much for that. Sun Min, um, we here in Europe often look to Korea as the example of how we should have been doing it, um, that, that somehow you've managed everything much better and we're very intrigued um, by your experience. Is that how it seems to you uh, deeply involved in delivery on the ground there in Korea? Yeah, uh, I'm very honored to join this mini kid event and share our experiences as the panelist. Uh, though nobody knows what will happen again in the future also in Korea, but uh, fortunately, 
uh, at this moment, and you confirmed the cases of COVID-19 showed about one to 200 per day. And all cause excess mortality showed within a range of uh, prediction, uh, even in the high prevalent area in Korea. Uh, I would say uh, the three factors of this success in this crisis in Korea. The first is the capacity of the diagnosis of the virus infection at the national level. When we first realized the epidemic uh, 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 crisis, uh, the government uh, tried to enhance the capacity of the PCR uh, testing even uh, very early stages. Uh, so uh, at this moment, we are able to test more than uh, 25,000 cases per day, which means we can, uh, uh, all the exposed and suspected patients are able to be included uh, in the diagnostic test within a day, sometimes uh, within a few hours. The second is making the best use of the existing uh, data infrastructure. As you, you, as you know, Korea is lying on the national health insurance system covering 100% of the population within the single unified payer in order to cope with uh, a lot of challenges uh, also uh, uh, in the, the, uh, the health systems we have developed and widened the info, uh, information infrastructure for the representative example, we have developed uh, the national level the drug utilization system uh, within which all the doctors and the pharmacists can uh, check the safety of the drug prescription and the administration in the real time. Uh, this system enables the old clinicians check the risky history of the COVID-19 uh, including the travel history from the high prevalent region. Uh, in the last spring, when the government stressed the importance of the, the facial protection masks to the people, uh, we were confronted with the panic buying of the facial masks. So we, uh, Women's Hero, has developed uh, the, uh, the mask di distribution system uh, through which we can check all the the purchasing history of the patients uh, of uh, facial masks and we send the information to the old pharmaceutical stores. So within a few weeks, we could uh, cope with the, the panic buying crisis. Uh, and third point is uh, the governance of the relevant organization in order for fighting with the COVID-19, not only CDC and Ministry of Health and Welfare, uh, all the relevant organizations, including the local governments, uh, are linked within the umbrella of the central digest management headquarters. Uh, of course, it's, uh, all the above is uh, uh, was uh, possible thanks to the three important infrastructure. The first is, uh, as I mentioned, the single unified insurance system. And the second is the nationally advanced information infrastructure. Uh, though uh, two infrastructure, the national health insurance and the information infrastructure were not developed for the purpose of the COVID-19 management, uh, but they shed light upon the, this crisis. Thirdly, I would like to stress the experiences of MERS in 2015. Uh, after painful experiences of MERS, the governments uh, have built the crisis management system so uh, I would like to stress again that the resilience and preparedness for the health system crisis does not stand alone. Uh, instead, uh, it should be linked uh, with uh, the pre-existing healthcare delivery system and the universal coverage system. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sun Min. I mean, I think that that all s seems to make a lot of sense. I think when you say it, that you know you you were. You had a governance system in place because of things that had gone on in the past. You had a data infrastructure and, and you had a capacity, I suppose, of, of diagnosis and response, which perhaps exceeded uh, what we've had, what we've seen in, in Europe. Um, still, I think it's very surprising to us, maybe from the outside, that your case levels remain so low. Um, uh, how, well, 
this, this is maybe beyond you to be able to answer. But, uh, you know, you talk about being able to test 25,000 and clearly compared with the number of cases you've got, that's, that's all you need. Believe me, Europe's having to do an awful lot more tests than that because we've got a lot more cases in many, many countries. Uh, and so it, it, it's interesting to try and understand why it is that it's not really even got going with a first wave, let alone a second wave, where, which we've seen in other countries. Do you, do you have any insights on to, to why you've not felt that, um, that the intensity of the, the pandemic as in, in our other countries? Uh, actually, uh, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, it's thanks to uh, the, 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 the behavior of all the people uh, in Korea, it's very usual to use the facial masks uh, since we have suffered from the, the smog and the, the, uh, the environmental uh, pollution. So, we are very uh, used to get used to the, the uh, use of the facial mask. That would be the sec uh, the first uh, uh, factors. The second is the painful experiences of the MERS. That means uh, uh, at the MERS uh, crisis, the, the, uh, the healthcare providers were very uh, weak and very uh, 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 susceptible to uh, the the hospital uh, infection uh, with the MERS, but uh, after we suffer from the MERS uh, crisis, we have built uh, the the infection control system within the hospitals and at the national level and the local government and and so on. Uh, of course, it's possible uh, thanks to the information infrastructure. For example, we also use beyond the health sectors, so we use all the credit card you, you use information and also the the CCTV information uh, in the process of the epidemic epidemiological investigation. But uh, totally, uh, I think it's uh, thanks to the facial masks. Uh, of uh, use of the common people. Yeah, I think this, this idea that somehow it's behavior of the population and we can't just look at our health systems in thinking about being ready for health challenges, but it's about health literacy, about behavioral change in the population as well. Uh, I think that's something that we, we're all probably taking away from this pandemic. Let me move uh, to, to you, Olivia, uh, and ask, I mean, obviously, there's a huge amount of attention being given to Sweden, both during the first wave where you managed things very differently, and now currently what's, what's going on in, in Sweden. What, what will you be um, thinking? What do you, lessons have you already learned about uh, the ability of your health system to absorb and manage change uh, in response to the pandemic? Thank you, Mark, and I'm also honored to be on this panel. It, it has certainly been a challenge for Sweden, but we have managed to, some parts we have managed very well. So Sweden was well prepared when it came to uh, scaling up our capacity. We doubled ICU capacity and has had available capacity from the beginning of the pandemic. And that means that we, were a, we have been able to take good care of our COVID patients. We also made a frog leap, I would say, uh, when it comes to uh, create a digitalized health system, uh, delivering health services in new digital ways. Um, that goes for follow-up visits for patients, for example, with chronic conditions or digital monitoring for patients delivering care uh, in their homes, but also for reviewing uh, pharmaceutical prescriptions and for um, Bookie uh, for uh, consultations and other kinds of health information. So we have had great use of our national digital platforms for information and uh, uh, contacting health services. Uh, and we know that to have accurate information has been key in fighting this pandemic, Bo both information on how to behave, but also information on state of the art in our health systems. So that has been key and also key for building trust. And we, in Sweden, we say that we have had a big amount of trust between our health system and our public or our local society. And that is still there, we measure it. So it's a increased, uh, uh, we have a 
uh, really high trust in how we are dealing with it from health service perspective and also from public health perspective. And finally, I would say in Sweden, we have created a tight collaboration in a quite fragmentized health system. And that is an investment that we, of course, want to keep uh, further along. I mean, Lily, that, that last point, that's, that's long been a problem, of course, in, in Sweden. Your, your system has not always worked together particularly well between all the different uh, parts of the system, you know, the, the, the regions and the, the national system. So, so how is, is this just because people have no choice? The pandemic is just so overwhelming that they started to work together. In, in which case, do you think that once things go back to normal, if they ever go back to normal, that people will maintain that collaborative process or have you actually changed structures to make it easier for people to, to work together? I think we had all the tools, but the awareness of the importance of uh, bridging the gaps in our fragmentized systems were not there, but now it's there. So uh, we have worked in a, a quite high tempo just to uh, coordinate care around the uh, individual per, uh, patient from local level to regional level. And we also saw that in our preparedness system, we had some gaps uh, between national level, regional level, local level that we had to bridge. So it has to do with, uh, we, had, we had the tools, but also uh, the persons in, the, in this, uh, I mean, stakeholder system has been reaching up. Uh, so, and that has to do with uh, the fact that you now have one goal for the health system. And that is really something that makes it more easy, easy uh, when, you, when it comes to collaboration, because you usually have a very big health agenda. You should address uh, accessibility or uh, mortality when it comes to cancer or person-centeredness or uh, elderly care or, uh, yeah, a lot of things that is on the political agenda. Now we have, we have one target that everyone is reaching for, and that makes it so easy to address actions in the systems, and uh, you have the same platform when going into uh, collaboration. Yeah, I, I suppose that's what worries me, is that whilst the health systems in many respects have responded, I think overall, better than probably I would have expected, and maybe that you would have expected in response to such an enormous shock, is this something that will be carried through all these different changes? And I think there's a number of areas where I'm, I'm not sure that we necessarily will. Uh, when I look at what's been happening, to, even to reactions to things like telehealth, which I thought would have been one of the, the easy big wins uh, mm -hmm. to come from this crisis, that we would be moving to better use of things like telehealth consultations. Not no, so that's obvious, that's all no, I think, Mark, uh, when it comes to the digitization of health service delivery, I think that is here to stay. It's investments that have been made now. We will keep it that way. Wonderful. And that very much brings us naturally on to, to you, Ran, given, given your title and what I know you've been doing in, in uh, Israel in response to the crisis in terms of, uh, of innovation. Um, I mean, clearly that has been one of the, the central ways that Israel has tried to respond to this crisis is quite deliberately to be innovative in your, on your response. So what, what do you have to share with us? Well, I think, you know, Israel is a country that on one hand has a very tight health spending and a very thinly stretched healthcare system. I think it's known globally uh, with nearly 100% bed occupancy every winter and one of the lowest uh, um, um, spending uh, on healthcare um, of any uh, other OECD country. And so that's not a very favorable starting point to an event that stretches the healthcare system to, it, to, to the margins. But uh, Israel is also not unfamiliar with emergencies, right? And we had a long-standing pandemic contingency plan that was actually drilled several times. So we had a pretty good idea of what's about to happen and what would the first steps be, and that, that was helpful uh, early on. So actually I could tell two very different uh, stories. Uh, one is of the successful first wave mitigation and also a cautionary tale of the second wave and the price of hubris. Um, uh, but what, what I'll focus now is actually on four aspects that were helpful and maybe of interest um, uh, to the people, uh, at least in the very uh, first wave. One was um, effective, um, proactive, early protection of the elderly and the high-risk groups. 
and this is, I think, very critical. Uh, the proportion of these groups uh, were uh, pretty low very early on, uh, but they actually further declined from 25% to 17% of the infected daily quite rapidly. And that was done with a very intensive, proactive approach of trying to, uh, first of all, let the people, not just the elderly, but also those with chronic diseases know that they are at risk and to tell them to keep at home, to refrain uh, from exposure. And that was very helpful, especially this was important with a very large plan that if you'd like, we'll uh, talk more later about uh, protecting patients at home, at uh, patients, old people's home and institutions. So that is one component. Uh, the second one, is, is I think was already mentioned, uh, is the issue of early diagnostic testing, uh, mass testing free of charge and in large scale. I think still now in one of the highest rates globally of performing uh, PCR testing, uh, already over 80,000 uh, tests PCR per day that we're able to do and the numbers are continuously increasing in terms of our capabilities. Um, so that is, has been proving to be very important in, in mitigating. The third component would be uh, the timely adaptation of the care in the hospitals, including refraining from ventilation. Very early on, we, we understood that putting the patients on ventilators was not a very good idea, um, uh, as well as uh, the type of supportive care and proning, putting the patients on their bellies basically uh, during uh, ventilation. Uh, so all of this I think was helpful. And this is one of the reasons why the case fatality rates in Israel till this day are one of the lowest one globally. Uh, when you take a look at CFRs. Um, final point I'd like to mention is that we have did a very rapid transition to online care. So we had all the infrastructure there for digital health, uh, but what we done very fairly quickly was to turn the focus to uh, chronic disease management and proactive preventive medicine, we're understanding that this is one of the key things that were hurt during the early stages and the lockdowns. Uh, so this is the type of digital health we pride ourselves of and we try to move the focus as early as possible to maintaining this from afar and through a, a proactive approach. So I think I'll stop with these four and we can discuss the details later. Yeah, th thanks very much. I think that brings us quite naturally to a, to a question that I really wanted to ask you all, which is about this, this double burden issue. Uh, I mean, clearly what happened during the first lockdown is that largely speaking, our hospitals just said, we're not dealing with anything other than, than COVID canceled, anything which was non-emergency uh, COVID response. And uh, you know, we've seen the impacts of that. We see it in the data that, that more people have been dying from heart attacks, from stroke, from, from other diseases uh, than we would have expected in a normal year, in addition to all the deaths that we, we're getting from COVID. So really, uh, I, I think what we've seen in the second wave in Europe um, is that countries have reacted a little bit differently and have been trying to keep those non-emergency services going. And I think this is an interesting example maybe of, of how we have learned from our experience during the pandemic. So, so Minister Vincaley, what's been your experience with this? Has, has Latvia managed to do better this, uh, this time round in terms of managing this double demand? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, at, uh, at the spring, we closed uh, already immediately all uh, planned services, uh, keeping uh, uh, space in hospitals and capacities vacant, uh, uh, waiting for COVID patients. Uh, a number of COVID patients at the spring was very low, actually, a few dozens uh, in Latvia. But uh, that affect very heavily um, uh, accessibility for uh, plant services. Uh, we uh, kept uh, open uh, some uh, acute care and uh, oncology and uh, some, um, some, some specific uh, uh, very important things, but still, uh, even in normal time, we have a quite long waiting list for planned services and our accessibility isn't great to be uh, diplomatically speaking. Uh, but now uh, that uh, uh, is one of our two ult uh, ultimate goals, uh, keep uh, uh, healthcare uh, uh, open as long as uh, it is possible. And uh, now we reorganize uh, uh, capacities of bed uh, uh, designated for uh, COVID patient, uh, but we do this uh, uh, on uh, uh, to shrinking the uh, 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 
um, ambulatory care, not uh, not planned care. So, and uh, also we look very carefully. Actually, we uh, mm -hmm. designing tailor made solutions because we are a small country and we can manage uh, all hospitals like one by one. So, and we know situation in uh, every small regional hospital. So uh, that is our uh, ultimate goal, uh, not to close uh, uh, close, uh, uh, close uh, healthcare system. But uh, one problem um, uh, that is uh, now uh, in the picture, we have, uh, of, uh, of course, uh, as the many European countries shortage of healthcare workers. And uh, our nurses and doctors are working in uh, several places, uh, you know, and uh, it's almost impossible uh, uh, to apply the safest approach in healthcare, not to cross uh, those uh, workers' flow. Because if we restrict, um, for example, working just at the one place, then uh, almost half of uh, our healthcare system just immediately shut down be because of the lack of um, human resources. And uh, now we, like uh, magicians, try to balance uh, safety uh, and accessibility and uh, uh, and uh, effective uh, effective um, uh, care for health for COVID patients. Uh, now we are working also uh, of uh, uh, we are working to to develop um, uh, healthcare at home. Uh, like uh, to provide um, patients uh, with those uh, special oxy, help me how to pronounce this, you know, the oxygen uh, monitoring system, portable systems. And of course, uh, also um, uh, the family doctors, uh, general practitioners uh, uh, are, are, are like fundamental uh, pillar of uh, of uh, uh, of um, services at home, so that is uh, also the 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 the, the point of um, that is uh, our um, the, the one of the uh, like uh, direction yeah. we are working on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Minister. That, I think that was uh, very interesting because I, mean, I think for for not non people people who aren't really involved in the sector that much they. They assume that the big constraint in the health system has been number of beds. I mean, you still leave this now. It, it, as far as, well, I, I should ask you, but as far as I can see, it's, it's never really been beds, except in a very short term. It has been health workers. Uh, it's been the number of people who can actually look after people in those beds, not having the beds. Beds, after all, not that difficult to put in place a few beds, uh, as many, many countries have shown. Minister Fayan, you, you talked about um, this problem of the double burden in your the double demand in your opening remarks and you talked about this this backlog um, that's building up uh, in in health issues uh, how how are you intending to to deal with this as you go forward well it has been a challenge and uh, again as i said a lot of key workers have had to self-isolate and um, there's a lot of weariness after seven or eight months of working on the front line We've used um, e-health to our advantage. Um, we rolled out the telehealth in GP practices and uh, OPD clinics. We also had a, a very simple thing, the implementation of the electronic transfer of prescriptions. Um, this was fast forwarded. Um, it was probably resisted over the years and this has been a huge change. Um, also, we've had a COVID-19 tracker uh, tracing app, which I just wanted to bring in. Uh, as well, but um, effectively, uh, we're, 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 we've, we've had a very much a community uh, support in health and well-being, and we're looking at it from a different angle as well, trying to prevent a lot of uh, these uh, uh, um, illnesses uh, as well. But it is a challenge, and um, uh, we are beginning to get people off the from the COVID uh, and the frontline staff to uh, address these uh, these issues of um, not acute care, but effectively. Uh, um, uh, for primary care. That, that, that's interesting what you say about community support. I mean, it, it looks as if that's been, in addition to all the digital changes and maybe uh, 
more acceptance of digital health in all sorts of different areas post-crisis. This looking at community support, as Minister Minkaley said, um, home care uh, support, maybe this is something else that might come from, from the crisis. Yeah, we've increased our uh, health budget, our well-being budget from 6 million to 20 million, just, uh, uh, just um, but also we, we have, um, we, we have a, a, local authorities have had a community call where people have gone out, helped elderly people, uh, um, and we've had our GA, which is a, our, it's a, it's a local um, group, uh, a, a sporting organization. They've been very, very involved. So we've had a, a great buy-in from the public and we genuinely, um, it's still there and there's a goodwill there. Uh, I don't know what we would have done only for that goodwill. Uh, of course, working with professionals from the HSE, the Department of Health and all the various stakeholders, but it, it's something that we feel that, um, that can be used and utilised in the future. Fantastic. A very interesting uh, learning there. Um, Olivia, of course, one of the reasons why Sweden didn't go into lockdown in the first wave was, as we understand it, explicitly because you were worried about the impact that it might have on, on the rest of the health system and you were trying to keep um, the rest of the health system working and not be overly obsessed with with covid did did it work and and how are you doing in this second wave is the double double burden more difficult now you're still mute yeah yeah uh, i think it has worked and as you say mark we aimed for have a uh, having a perspective to consider all health perspectives and that's why we didn't uh, did a lockdown on schools pupils have been able for all of the time to go to their schools because we thought that that was a would affect the health so negative to, to close schools. So we have had this public health approach to all our uh, measures that we, uh, the government has been uh, deciding on. And it has worked. If you, can, if you uh, read the statistics now, we can't see any increase of suicidal rate or increase of uh, um, mental health illness. Uh, but we are, of course, we have some uh, um, uh, signs that this of course will be a problem for Sweden as well but we can't see it in statistics uh, now uh, but I would say that in the first way we were quite affected uh, by um, in our the rest the other parts of the healthcare system by the pandemic but in the other way not so effective but in the first part I mean we had to reallocate resources so we had to stop or uh, pause uh, screening uh, programs and uh, elective surgery and other kinds of planned care. And uh, it was also a fact that many patients avoided to come to scheduled appointments. So we had uh, uh, actually a, a situation where several primary healthcare clinics, they were, I mean, uh, lacking patients. So uh, they could keep up their businesses, but they were not able to since patients didn't come. But in this second wave then, um, uh, we have seen that our health system has bounced back quite quickly. So now we are, I mean, up to speed with the elective surgery until now, but it might, if, if we have to see a worse situation, of course, we have to reduce that again. But we see also uh, that our health workforce is very tired and health workforce is, I mean, that's a crucial thing now. Uh, but at the same time, we see more young people applying to uh, doctors and nurses programs in university. It has increased by 30%. So health workforce is tired, but health to become a health uh, worker is super attractive now for young people. When building back also, we see uh, an increased need to invest in preventive measures and public health because we see that we can't tackle uh, the increasing waiting times only by uh, performing more surgical interventions. You can't, I mean, just, yeah. that's not the only thing we are aiming for. We have two a double aim, both of course, increasing surgical interventions and uh, planned care visits, but also at the same time, invest in preventive measures uh, and public health, because you have to work both parts. You can't just, I mean, get rid of all the um, postponed uh, care by 
making health workforce work harder, performing more surgery, uh, surgical interventions. Wow, well, I mean, a lot of really fascinating things there that I, I wish we had more time to follow up. I mean, certainly I think uh, in mental health in other countries, we certainly have seen uh, in indicators at least of yep. worsening mental health. So if there is a difference between um, Sweden and other countries, uh, and it will take us a while, of course, to get comparative data and so on, that, that would certainly be an extremely interesting finding about the different approach that's been taken. And I, I think it's fascinating about how many more people are applying for, for healthcare jobs in, in Sweden. I wonder if that's um, more general. We will have to look at those numbers uh, and see. Ran, um, I'd like to ask you now, I mean, uh, how, how do you think Israel has managed the, the double burden um, of COVID and non-COVID? Do you think you've done it well? Well, you know, I think that in the first wave, uh, we've had the same problems as everyone else. We were very much focused on uh, just um, trying to understand what has hit us. And so I don't think there was enough attention uh, spent on, on this critical issue. But very quickly afterwards, I think uh, uh, things evened, evened out. And uh, we were the first country, I think, to undergo a serious second wave uh, of all of the OECD countries, um, which, which was... Uh, very substantial, although in comparison to some of, of other countries right now, it seems uh, uh, pretty much in control. Um, I would say that in the second wave, we handled it completely differently. I mean, we handled it pretty well. Uh, first of all, at any point, did the hospitals not uh, um, stop uh, the elective uh, procedures and all of the uh, community uh, focused care, as you know, care in Israel is very much focused on, on the care within the community and within the primary healthcare setting and a lot of emphasis on preventive medicine and proactive care uh, between the GPs uh, and their uh, target population. And everybody, it's this universal coverage that is mainly for free. And so the, the um, emphasis on uh, the second wave was on maintaining all of those services uh, to continue. And the ongoing uh, emphasis that we've had in Clalit was actually to create predictive proactive approaches in which we try to identify specific domains where we said this will not happen by itself. We need to proactively approach the patients, call them and make sure that something happens to them. So we had lists of intervention. Some of them were pretty simple, uh, such as patients who missed their uh, prescription drug and we wanted to make sure that they're not stopping their care. Those who missed an appointment and should have been done either in, in cancer or in, in on other non-communicable diseases care that we wanted to approach. But some of it was more based on uh, predictive Approaches and we created uh, predictive uh, analytics um, in order to find patients at high risk of deterioration. And the physicians have been asked to proactively approach those patients and un go through a specific set of steps in order to make sure that those patients do not fulfill this potential of deterioration uh, in, in various aspects. And that is above and beyond some specific uh, um, intervention programs for multimorbid patients and, and, and the likes. Very good. Um, now, I'm, I'm not going to ask you that question, Sun Min, because I'm not sure it's quite so so relevant for Korea, unless you you would like to add anything to that, in which case wave at me and or just take your speaker off mute and answer. Yeah. yeah uh, even though we did not okay. uh, there is the total lockdown, but uh, we uh, in some area uh, named Daegu, we have uh, uh, the very high prevalent uh, uh, season for about a, a few weeks. Uh, at that time, uh, that area fell short of uh, the, the, the hospital beds uh, to treat the patients. So the, the governments and the local governments uh, uh, divided the three levels of care facility. The first is the general hospitals to treat the, the severe uh, COVID-19 patients. The second uh, level uh, facility was, we call it the uh, living care centers, uh, it, which is uh, 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 in some sense, a low level care uh, centers with uh, a couple of uh, health personnel uh, uh, to uh, keep the patients be tracked with the health resources. The third uh, level is isolation at the home uh, home you know with the regular check but at those times we worried about uh, the high 
poor quality or high mortality of the uh, the other disease than COVID-19, for example, acute myocardial infarction, we have assessed the 30-day mortality of the acute myocardial infarction, but virtually within that period, we did not uh, 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 find that any increase of the case of fatality, but we have designated some level of the hospitals. The first one is for COVID-19. The second one is the, the other pulmonary, uh, the, the respiratory diseases then that, that uh, COVID-19. The third one is uh, for the, the other diseases then uh, COVID or pulmonary uh, diseases. Uh, we, so uh, in this way, we totally uh, uh, separated the moving track of the patients. So that is the way we have managed the double uh, crisis of COVID-19 and the other disease burden. Interesting that you found no uh, increase in 30-day uh, mortality for, for AMI. Uh, we certainly have seen an, an increase in some countries. I mean, the, this is one of the indicators OECD collects, as you know, and we, we haven't collected it for, for all countries. It's too, too uh, recent. But certainly we're finding that there is data coming out in one or two places, which is suggesting an increase in 30-day uh, mortality, which is obviously very disturbing. I, I think, colleagues, if it's okay with you, I'm going to ask a question uh, that's come from the audience. Um, and there's one question, oh, one question which has received quite a lot of support, which uh, is that it is increasingly clear that public health is a complex public policy issue, inextricably linked to things like the economy, jobs, education, public transport, et cetera. So how can we design better public health systems that reflect the overlapping nature of these areas? Is that something that you've been considering? Um, I'm tempted to start with, with you, Minister Fayan, because it's clearly in your, your responsibility to think about things like this. Have you been reconsidering how you do public health in response? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, um, when it comes to the economy in our budget, we increased our public health funding by 20% once off so um that's across the board and we are as i said the slauncher care which we we're bringing in as i said uh supporting health and well-being for vulnerable people but also uh, but delivering health in the right place at the right time um but we are looking at alternative approaches now uh, we feel that the um ee medicine will certainly uh, help us also the um uh, uh, the online consultations have been helpful. We are trying to tackle obesity, uh, trying to get people Ireland running. We have um, uh, we, we have a 21 day challenge and we, we've had a keep well campaign, which we've looked at all aspects of of, of society from from uh, mental health to physical activity. Um, we're bringing opera singers to uh, local uh, uh, care homes um, uh, and we're, we have a food, a board beer, where we um, have people that the cook well, they're at home uh, to read a book, the local libraries are getting involved. So we have a buy-in, and I suppose it's such a small country, but we still have a very uh, close network of families and communities. And we really are delighted that the communities are buying in to this Keep Well campaign, which is effectively, um, uh, it's, it's a second uh, rerun of, of a campaign we tried to run four or five months ago as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Have, have you been when you when you're designing your your public health policies? How when does the economic aspect come into play? I mean, obviously it has to. I mean, when you when you're talking about some of the responses that are the choices that you've got to respond to the pandemic, some have a much bigger impact on the economy that, than others. Is that factored in when you're actually developing the policy options, or is that then? the policy options are developed by the public health people and then the decision about which to choose of those options is made at the political level. In other, in other words, is it treated as a technical issue or a political issue to bring in these, these uh, other... It, it's more technical. I think uh, the politicians have followed um, the advice of the experts for, for, for once, um, but we certainly are following the advice um, 
of, of a public health experts. There are complications, but uh, I think that we have thrown as much finance at it as possible at everything uh, across the board. And um, uh, But again, we've only really in the last few years looked at alternative wellness uh, within our public health system. And uh, this has been totally accelerated, again, as I said, with e-technology and uh, with a lot of innovative um, maybe ways of how we, we deal with, um, uh, 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 with delivering health. But uh, there were issues over the years that couldn't be resolved. And the COVID-19 uh, has actually given us opportunities now. And also the health service, like probably most countries, was used as a political football. Um, for the first time, people, um, there's, there's a genuine appreciation and there is a window of opportunity, I think, that we can work together, not the political side, but from the health service. They, they, they feel empowered, uh, they feel uh, vindicated, uh, and also people out there are having, you know, a clapping. Um, you, you can just see it, whereas, uh, whereas we probably had a, a race to the bottom, maybe, of, uh, of saying the health service wasn't good enough to our issues, but there, there, there is an opportunity here that we can, if we can work on, and I think we are beginning to work on that opportunity of goodwill. Thank you very much. What, what about you, Minister Vincaley? How, how do you go about incorporating these wider issues into the public health decision making? Actually, I can thank the COVID pandemic uh, in some way uh, of, of giving us opportunity uh, Okay, I have a privilege to, to represent the country with uh, quite mild impact uh, from COVID, but still. But my hope is that we, at least in Latvia, finish forever discussion uh, health versus economy, health versus political issues. Because we struggle uh, with, with this false dilemma for, uh, I don't know, for, since, since, for 30 years now. And uh, uh, some days uh, ago, uh, I heard a discussion uh, uh, organized by Chatham House and uh, uh, two brilliant speakers were on the panel, uh, uh, David Heyman and uh, Dr. Fossey. And uh, they underlined specifically that the uh, uh, adequate response on uh, uh, this pandemic and every other pandemic uh, in the future and the most effective response is uh, uh, implement uh, universal health uh, uh, care approach uh, and uh, provide uh, health promotion. And all those approaches uh, actually are uh, very strongly tied by social economical factors and uh, we know that uh, uh, healthcare system uh, uh, impacts just uh, around 20 percent of uh, uh, of population health the other factors are uh, like well-being uh, i don't know the place of the household uh, 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 situation environmental issues and so and um, uh, yeah, we also, uh, our government tried to follow um, uh, the advice and, uh, and, and, and expertise of epidemiologists and uh, infectologists, but when it comes to uh, meet, uh, meet the, the uh, uh, very tough political decisions, then somehow we tried to slip from those advices for following those advices. And that is um, very complicated, yeah. But in uh, my opinion, that is easier job on the world, just follow the uh, expert uh, advice. So, especially in a crisis caused by, uh, by disease, not by hurricanes or uh, political instabilities. But um, that is challenging, that is very challenging because uh, uh, to implement uh, uh, epidemiologist advices, uh, politicians, uh, including myself, we have to do not very pleasant things uh, in the sake of common cause. And um, sometimes, uh, you know, yeah, sometimes the other, uh, uh, other reasons uh, uh, play 
significant role also that influenced the decisions of politicians. So thank you. Very good. Uh, that was really interesting. Th thank you for that. You know, uh, Olivia, I'm going to ask you just a another question that's come up from the, the chat, which I think is quite interesting. It certainly relates to something that you've been saying already today. And, and that's really, um, has the health crisis only accelerated existing trends or has it made us rethink the direction we are going? Big question. Clearly some trends have been continued, mm -hmm. but are you actually rethinking as well? Uh, very good uh, question, I would say, and we have discussed that a lot in Sweden. And I would say to some part, or to a high extent, it has accelerated changes that was ongoing when the pandemic started, like the digitalization or patient-centeredness or uh, how to collaborate in the health system in order, uh, in order to create a more patient-centered care, etc. And also the focus on uh, public health measures. Uh, but to some extent also it has forced us to think out Side the boxes, and that has to do with the uh, other parts of the society. I would say that we have had organized, we have organized society that is uh, to a high extent dependent on uh, uh, timely delivery. I mean, we have no uh, storages or supplies uh, left here in Sweden. It's uh, only it's a service delivery system that goes on all hours um, uh, in a week. Uh, so we were, uh, as other countries also, experiencing a shortage of the PPEs and uh, MTUs and everything that we should have in storage. Or, so we have, it has forced us to think that how can we manage to have a better preparedness when it comes to, uh, uh, for example, yes, medical, technic medical equipment uh, and uh, PPEs and other things, not maybe to build back our own own storages, but to have a system that where we are, which can be adapted very quickly uh, to new situations and uh, uh, new crises. So we have a, to be adaptive and to react much more uh, fast. Uh, I would say it's it is a new learning that we are quite slow and uh, we lack this ability to adapt. So we are looking into the old systems here. So that's, I would say, a new uh, learning. And uh, also that, I mean, every crisis is new. So we can't just uh, learn from this crisis and do anything that we should have done uh, in advance uh, to this crisis. But we have to just train our ability to adapt uh, and all the system. And in that, to think outside the door box also is that we now, we are coming from the public sector here but we need to work much better with the civil society and also with the industry together with the public uh, sector. So also to use all four, all stakeholders within the society, that's something that we just have to also rethink. I think, I mean, everything that comes has to do with pharmaceuticals come from the industry. We have been better here, but we have to build, we had, we have, had to be new pathways here. We should have those, those have, should have been built in advance of the crisis. And civil society also, I mean, underestimated always. There is so much uh, uh, power there that we have to use in crisis. Fantastic, that's really interesting. Uh, and I wonder, Sun Min, do you recognize those issues in, in looking at what you will, um, the existing trends, things like digitalization and patient centeredness and public health, and the new learnings um, about things that you might, the, the response to the pandemic, which you'll, you'll take it into the future. How, how is it seen from Korea? Uh, yes, uh, in Korea, uh, it's very peculiar that we are largely depending on the private care, private uh, sector providers. Uh, uh, at least in Korea, the people uh, started to re, uh, started to necessity of redesign of the health system in toward the more uh, public sector dominant uh, systems. It means not 
only uh, uh, re uh, acceleration of re uh, existing uh, changes, but uh, it means uh, uh, we have to redesign what is the health and what is what should uh, what is the good health systems. I think it is the very good uh, opportunity uh, for Korean government and Korean people to redesign and re uh, start at the. Uh, the, the, uh, the growth thinking about the health systems uh, resilience and preparedness and also what is the good health systems I think it's the uh, it will happen the new changes uh, in the public health is. so so what do you think they they might be you know what what's what is the the elements of a, a good health system now that we've seen the pandemic, what, what do you think there might be more support for now than uh, there wasn't before the crisis? It's very difficult to uh, answer, but uh, what is important, uh, what uh, the Korean people started to uh, more important is the safety, uh, not only uh, the, the narrow uh, meaning of the patient safety, but also it's a kind of human security uh, at, the, at the, the national level, not only the health level, uh, we realize that all the health issues are not stand alone, but uh, linked with the highly, deeply linked with the other sectors of the human security. So the health, good health system means uh, protecting the patient from uh, many crises. For that, uh, we, are building the hospitals, we uh, nurture the health resources and so on. So uh, the good health system uh, means uh, a lot of uh, good uh, uh, words, but the first one is the human security. Yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting because I mean, uh, Korea above all OECD countries is a country that I think has the most transactional view of, of health, you know, up, up to now it's been something is delivered to you. Uh, it's not about, you know, Mr. Bayan Be has well-being in his title. Um, up to now, at least, I don't think any Korean health minister yeah. would have been worried about well-being. It would have been about making sure that everybody can can come and see a doctor quickly. Um, that nobody kind of knows what will happen tomorrow. <laughs> quite. <laughs> uh, Ran, I mean, again, you, you too have mentioned some of the existing trends which really, really have been accelerated in terms of the crisis in, in Israel. But you also did point out some of the, the problems that you've been facing in terms of actually underinvestment and really operating at, at full capacity. Are there any areas where you see um, continuing of, of trends that were already there or areas where you really think that Israel might be going in a different direction post-pandemic? So I think um, the, the pandemic was the best accelerator of digital health that this country has witnessed. And it was always, you know, in the forefront of digital health. Um, a lot of uh, pockets of resistance that existed uh, for many years have been wiped out in a matter of days. I mean, uh, bureaucratic processes, red tape and unionistic worries were cast aside. And with a matter of two weeks, uh, uh, rates of acceptance of, of things that were already set the stage for were uh, enacted. And you know, once you go there, you cannot go back. Uh, and so the, the public had a taste of this. The physicians that were afraid had their, uh, you know, had their attempt. And I think from now on, um, th there's no um, uh, telling the difference between health, healthcare and digital health. These are all now the same. Uh, we will not go back to analog medicine uh, once we've been digital. So I think that, that this trend is only going to further ensue and there will be a new equilibrium that will actually come and go as the waves of illness will come in and out. Uh, the potential um, um, proportion of care that will be provided online will change accordingly. Um, and I think that more and more mechanisms that would move to uh, care not only from, from uh, 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 in-person to distant, but also the change of synchronous versus asynchronous healthcare provision is something that would gain much more traction now and people will be more open to, to new types. And, and actually what we've been talking all the time about the digital transformation of healthcare, 
And we, we've been all the time saying that digital transformation of healthcare is not taking the old processes and digitizing them. If you take a broken system and you digitize it, you get a digital broken system that actually might be even more costly and more problematic than the first one. Uh, the concept of digital transformation is the redesign, either partial or, or more uh, uh, wide, redesign of the care processes and that are augmented by the digital capabilities and by the technological advancement. And I think this is what has actually uh, has been happening, but is now being really accelerated in a way that I think is, is really um, amazing to see um, in, in all aspects, you know, uh, proactive, uh, asynchronous, uh, um, um, precision medicine on all of its aspects, and we can go on and on to examples. Um, my second part of the answer to your question is about, and this is more of a hopeful and, and wishful thinking than, than actual um, um, actions, is that I do hope that the government would realize at this point that the impact on the entire economy of maintaining a barely sustainable, fully stretched healthcare system has its tolls, not just for the health aspects of, of society, but also for the economy. And that maintaining some kind of safety margins uh, for the healthcare system is something that is required. Uh, if not for this crisis, then for the next one. And if there's something I think we can all agree is that pandemics are here to stay. And this is not the last crisis of its type for the coming uh, decades. And so it is only a matter of time until we will experience something different, but in many instances, very similar to this one. And I think, I hope that this kind of a take home message will sink in for all levels of decision makings in the government and would bear its fruits in the coming future. Thank you very much, Ran. And it's both an optimistic and very pessimistic message when we start talking about, we're gonna have more pandemics, but yeah, you're, you're indeed right. I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't expect another pandemic very soon. We're coming to the end, but I do want to ask very, very quickly one question. You don't all need to answer, just anybody who wants to answer a question that's come up, which is, is really whether we think that general population behavior will change as a result of the pandemic. I mean, we know that people who are obese have always been at much higher risk of uh, non-communicable diseases that can go through smoking, harmful use of alcohol, all sorts of different things. But now we see you're also at much greater risk for, for uh, infectious diseases as well. Do, do we actually think that the population behavior might change? Uh, I'm not going to ask you all, but anybody who would like to, to give a quick response to that? Yeah, Sun Min and then Minister Fayan, yeah. Uh, I don't know much about uh, the behavior of the lifestyle of the, uh, the chronic disease patients, but uh, actually, our government in Hira uh, has monitored and measured the, the change of the utility of the, the diseases. Uh, but for any acute uh, uh, diseases like uh, elective surgery, has decreased with the COVID nineteen crisis. But fortunately, the use of the, the medical use of the chronic uh, uh, diseases patient uh, has increased a little. So. It means that COVID-19 uh, uh, does not change with the healthcare utility behavior of the patients. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Minister Fayan. Yeah, I think um, there's huge opportunities here. Um, uh, people working from home, um, uh, you know, coming into Dublin, their traffic is down to maybe a third. Uh, it'll probably increase, but I, I think that uh, people's family times, even as politicians, we've... Um, We've got a bit more family time. We don't have meetings to go to or funerals to go to or things like that. And I think a lot of people um, have had time to reflect on what the most important things are in life. And I think there's a huge opportunity, not just for health, for, for, for all aspects of our economy. And what I've noticed is that a, a lot of people now are, um, are, are uh, d depositing more money into their bank accounts. So um, it's, a, it's a trend, uh, uh, certainly in Ireland, that... Um, it's, it's risen considerably, so you never know. Very, very interesting. Um, colleagues, I'm going to finish the, the, uh, the discussion in a second, but there, there is one closing question that's been asked at all these different uh, events that are, are part of this, this broader event on government after shock. Uh, and I'd like you just to answer very briefly, one minute, please, per speaker. It's what are you personally committed to doing differently in light of what has been revealed by the crisis. 
So does anybody want to start? Yeah, Ran. So it, one short thing would be uh, to remember that in these events, it's not over until it's over. Um, and in too many instances, we have declared victory and then we had to, you know, fold the flags and, and uh, you know, tr try to um, maintain our dignity as well as our public health uh, infrastructure after we have folded too quickly. So the reason we had the second wave was only because of hubris and because of our assessment that we have somehow magically found a way to beat the virus. And in these instances, you know, uh, the enemy does not tire. It does not uh, halt. And uh, if you do not maintain your vigilance in a public health crisis, history will repeat itself as a tragedy uh, on the second time. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Vincaley. Yeah, if I could, I would do differently to uh, more focus on tackling inequalities in the society, because uh, uh, especially in country as Latvia was uh, not such a like a, a high high uh, high uh, uh, level of well being, well -being uh, the inequalities affect very directly uh, how people behave because if you don't have your uh, savings at least for three months to survive of course you are going uh, you are more motivated to to go to work uh, with uh, mild symptoms and to avoid some restrictions so that is uh, uh, in latvia uh, especially it's directly connected with how we work and how we uh, tackle inequalities so that Fantastic. A commitment to tackle inequalities. That, that's uh, uh, very ambitious. Fantastic. Um, I'm looking at Sunmin, Olivia, Minister Fayen. What will you personally do? Yes, Sunmin? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, in curious experiences, I'd like to stress the building the sound healthcare delivery system. Uh, in order to prepare the new crisis uh, or the COVID-19, uh, we realized that uh, healthcare resources and delivery for treating uh, the infectious diseases is critically important. Not only the epidemiological testing or investigation uh, or public health, uh, the healthcare delivery system and the universal healthcare uh, has coverage is critically important to build a resilient and prepared uh, healthcare systems. Uh, so it was proven uh, in Korea's uh, history. I'd like to stress that uh, once again. Great. So it's a it's a commitment to continue to build healthcare coverage in Korea. Yeah, uh, Olivia. Thank you. Uh, that's personally. Uh, for me being the DG for our agency here in Sweden. So I think I will uh, speed up our processes. Uh, we are sometimes actually too slow. We have noticed when we are working very quickly during the pandemic and that affects relevance, of course, uh, and usefulness. So I will speed up processes when it comes to developing knowledge support and uh, performing data-driven analysis, etc. And secondly, I think I will increase the use of data because we have a lot of health data registries in Sweden. And during the pandemic, we have pooled data from a lot of registries, and that has really benefited our research and uh, our statistics. So I will keep on doing new innovative ways uh, when it comes to collecting and using data. And I think thirdly, um, I mentioned this before, uh, my work here uh, as a DD is very much circling around the national policy agenda for the healthcare sector, how to get results, how to... Um, uh, regulate, how to follow up, how to support implementation. So I think I will have a much clearer message on what is the priority. We have normally a lot of priorities that confuses providers and a much closer and tighter uh, collaboration. And that has really uh, improved during the pandemic. And I will increase that kind of work after the pandemic. Thank you. Fantastic. So speed up, use data more and focus the messages. Um, well, I think we could all learn from, from those three <laughs> things. <laughs> Minister Fayan. 
Yeah, yeah look, uh, the importance of technology in delivering the care and doing the teleconsultations and video consultations and e-prescribing, that's um, been fast-tracked and that has made, it's, it's helped, um, I suppose, save our healthcare system. Uh, also, um, we've been very, very fortunate as an island that we've had a, a great collaboration with the EU and the w, WHO and many other organisations. And I think globally, we need now to maybe build on those uh, communication structures uh, because um, uh, if, if another pandemic comes, we need to be uh, even better prepared. But we were fortunate that we had, uh, we were part of a bigger team uh, effectively in getting uh, PPE uh, equipment and many other uh, aspects. So um, I couldn't, I would just want to thank everybody for the collaboration. Fantastic. That, that, that's uh... <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you expect it from an international organisation, but yes, we do think that the pandemic has demonstrated absolutely how countries need to work together in order to be able to deal with global problems. The idea that somehow national responses are going to be sufficient clearly uh, is not going to work, or at least the results will be far worse than they need to be. Colleagues, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time. That has been a, a really good um, uh, discussion. I hope the audience have, have liked it a, a lot. I wish we could find a way to have applause so that we could uh, thank you in the usual way, but we can't. Well, we can. Yes, we can. We can. We can put our hands together and pretend, of course, that we're applauding. But thank you very much on behalf of all the audience and, of course, from the organisers here at the OECD for, for spending time with us here today. Uh, I hope to see you again soon. <laughs>